following interview was conducted with Albert W. Oberhauser, Stewart Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Physics for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, March 18, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Also sitting in is his wife, Margaret. Thank you and good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, let's start off by telling me where and when you were born and your parents and early years. I'll try. <laughs> I was born in San Diego, California in 1925. The reason we were there is in 1915, during World War I, my father enlisted in the Navy and made a career of it. And in 1925, he was stationed at the Naval Air Station in San Diego. Okay. And he retired after 20 years of service in 19. 35. Uh, he was an, a chief petty officer. His specialty was repairing airplanes that landed and took off from aircraft carriers. But uh, on retirement, we moved to San Francisco. The reason for that was my <coughs> mother was born in San Francisco and she, she she still had her mother and father alive and her, her brother, Warner. That's where my middle name comes from. Do you have so, any, any brothers or sisters? I have one sister okay. she, who died a year ago. Okay. Her name was Eva Claire. Can you tell us a little about grade school and high school? Well, I was going to get to that. Okay but I'm not used to <laughs> giving interviews. When, when we moved to San Francisco, I was 10 years old. We moved into a, the top f floor of a, a two-story flat, which just happened to be right next to the San Francisco Public Library. By the way, I was sent to a Montessori kindergarten and th there I knew how to learned how to read and write at the even when I graduated at the age of six <laughs> yeah graduation right <laughs> well <laughs> I don't sort remember of. that <laughs> but when I enrolled in grammar school because of my accomplishments already they put me into second grade so I was one year younger than everyone else in class. Okay. And this colored my personality. I was always the last to be chosen to <laughs> play baseball or whatever. Uh, <laughs> you learned that it happened at an early age, huh? <laughs> yes. Mm. That's very the, nice, though. The, the Let's see, where were we? You, I was, at grade school and high school. I'm in San Francisco uh -huh, now. Right, yeah. Yes. Uh, the, th the 30s in San Francisco was when the well-known bridges were being built. The San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge, which went from San Francisco to Marin County. Uh, my, un my uncle, Warner, used to take my sister and I on hikes. And the first day the bridge opened, it was for pedestrians only. Oh, great. That was in 1937. And so on that first day it was open, we walked across the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to do. But that day it was all pedestrians, no cars. What a nice event. Well, naturally, I took an interest in bridges, and I probably had all the bridge books in the library out. <laughs> <laughs> I only had to carry them 50 feet. <laughs> hmm. Let me ask you this. You were talking about the bridges. Did you see uh, some of the construction that was going on as well? Oh, absolutely. Okay. It was not too far from where, I mean, you could view it from where you lived or go over there? Well, a after... <clears throat> After the war was over, 
my parents bought a, an apartment house, 12 apartments, five rooms each. And <coughs> that address was on 216 4th Avenue, <coughs> which is fairly close to the entrance to, to the, the bridge? Golden Gate Bridge. Okay. You couldn't walk there or see it from where we lived, but that's the Richmond district of San Francisco. But studying, after studying all the bridge books in, from the library, I decided I wanted to be a civil engineer when I grew up. <coughs> I, I also had music lessons starting around that age, as soon as we moved to San Francisco. And I studied clarinet and saxophone. And I, I was fairly well talented along those lines. Uh, when I got to junior high school, which was from s s seven, eight, and ninth grade, I was in the school orchestra, the, the school marching band, and the school dance orchestra. And uh, so that took a lot of my time playing in all those... At those um, events. Those events. And I remember when I was graduating from junior high school, that was 1939, when I was graduating from ninth grade, it would have been. Uh, I, was, I was the concertmaster of the school orchestra, and we were in the auditorium practicing, and the principal of the school came down and sat beside me uh, in, in, a, in a bench seat there. And my final report card was sitting on my music stand. <laughs> so he just reached over and picked it up and looked at it and says, hey, you can't graduate. <laughs> Why not? Well, you haven't had enough physical education classes <laughs> and it's a law that you have to have this many in order to graduate. So he picked out his pen and wrote down that I had taken a particular uh, class. Class. And then he said, "What what teacher would you like to have had?" And so then he forged that, that teacher's name on my <laughs> report card. That's great. So that's how I happened to graduate from ninth grade. And that was your best class ever, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> and. They, my parents picked a private school for for high school for me, Lick Wilmer Dean. That Lick is the Lick of James Lick of the Lick Observatory. That he endowed the school, an industrial endowed the Wilmer Dean School. They were originally separate schools, but they happened to be on the same block, and so they combined them. There was a. A block away, there was a girls' private school called Lux, and eventually the th three schools became just one. It's known as LWL, Lick Wilmerding Lux. My sister went to Lux. She, my sister was two years old, older than me. The reason they picked that school for me was because it didn't have a music program. I mean, I was so involved in music that I would, I was in uh, private dance orchestras that would go out and and perform in, in oh. gigs, and that they felt that wasn't a, a good way to lead your life. So they picked Lick Wilmerding for me to go to, so there would be no music, <laughs> and it was probably a good thing uh, that I graduated as I said already, in 1939. Uh, I, w I wanted to mention the fact that in 1939, my father was called back into the service, even though he had been retired since 35, and the, the United States was preparing for war. And he was sent to the Naval Air Station in Corpus Christi, Texas, where they train flyers to land 
airplanes on aircraft carriers and things like that. So he was away from home from 1939 until the war ended in 1944, 45. He didn't get home at all during that time? Uh, only for a one or two sure. week vacation. Was he based in Corpus Christi for the during the war? Yes. Oh, okay. And uh, it was very hard for my mother to run an apartment house with 12 apartments, five rooms each. Right. And so I had to learn how to do wallpaper hanging and painting and plumbing and repairs and all that sort of thing, mm -hmm. which was okay. But there were still a lot of real estate vacancies in San Francisco on the West Coast. Real estate got very tight on the East Coast because of the war in Europe. So there, we had several vacant apartments. And a man came in around the 1st of August in 1941. He was a reporter from an international news agency. He was looking for an apartment just the kind that we had for he, his wife, and I think he had two children. And so he placed a deposit on an apartment, planning to move in September 1st. And so that was a relief. But he came back the last week of August. He had a telegram from his headquarters and said, you are being transferred to Honolulu immediately to cover the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. That was in August, and the attack was December 7th, as you know. Mm -hmm. So I've actually never t told this story hmm. other than to my friends. But I was standing on by my, my mother's side when this gentleman c came in our apartment. <clears throat> and uh, I was there. This is a first-hand account. My mother began to cry. She had been trying to get uh, my father transferred from Corpus Christi, Texas, to the San Francisco Bay Area, where there are a lot of naval installations. She began to cry and said, now Daddy will never come home. And um, he, he didn't come home until the war ended in hmm. 1945. But the government knew that the Japanese were planning to attack Pearl Harbor. We, they had broken the uh, Japanese code, and uh, all the aircraft carriers were moved out of Honolulu, but they left the battleships there. Uh, nobody knows why, hmm. but people high up in the administration knew, knew there was going to be an attack on Pearl Harbor. Hmm. And I don't know to what extent that that is well-known history or not. Mm -hmm. But you're talking to a f person who was there mm. when my mother was reading this telegram, and she read it out loud. Mm. Did your mother get a chance to go to Corpus Christi no. to see your father? He couldn't. No, no. Mm. he was too busy. Mm -hmm. They were planning, you know, training all the yeah. pilots <clears throat> for the aircraft carriers. And, uh, well, Lick Wilmerdine was a unique school, as I already intimated, not merely because they had no music program, <laughs> but uh, they had a fantastic faculty the uh, in th three years of high school, I had six courses in physics, and the teacher was very inspiring. His name was Ralph Britton, and uh, I decided to give up the aspiration to become a civil engineer and design bridges. <laughs> I decided to become a physicist as a result of that. They also had a 
a f fantastic chemistry teacher. I think his name was Sidney Vesnes. The first day of class, we I had his course in chemistry the first year at Le Coumardin. And the first day of class, he would hang out, hand out to everyone in the class a periodic table of the elements, a photogra photographic copy. And because during this semester, we would have to know that periodic table by heart. And that periodic table that he gave me is still in my wallet. It's been in my wallet since all those no, years? 1939. Right. You have it folded up, huh? No, oh. it, it, it's about that big, and it's, uh, I had it, uh, when you put plastic put on it, uh, not many years ago. It's uh -huh. dog-eared at the corners. But uh, as a result of that, I, I've always known where to look in the periodic table for things I'm interested in. So I, I, I graduated from Wickham Reading in 1942, and, and in a way, having gone into science, well, was very good for me because for, for a couple of years, the United States exempted people studying science from the draft. It, it, eventually, I enlisted in the Navy because that draft exemption was turned off by Congress. I, I went to college at University of California, Berkeley, which is just across the bay from where I lived. And uh, that was a a fabulous university. It still is, of course. <clears throat> it was also relatively inexpensive. The tuition per semester was $27 at Berkeley in those days. Not twenty seven hundred or twenty seven thousand. Twenty seven. Two seven. <laughs> Two seven. <laughs> Point zero zero. Yeah, I, I lived in, in in Berkeley at a boarding house, but uh, I would to take the the bus home on weekends to use my parents' washing machine. Sure. As everyone does who lives close enough to home. What was the campus like when you were there? It was a beautiful campus, mm -hmm. lots of lawns and things like that. Did you live in the boarding house the whole time you were there? Uh, the, the first semester I lived with a, a cousin in Emeryville, but that didn't work out very well. It was uh -huh. a very long commute distance, and so except for my first semester. I lived in a boarding house sure. one block north of campus. Mm -hmm. You mentioned enlisting in the service. Were you out of it when you went to college, or how did that work out? Well, I went to Cal in the fall of 1942, right after I graduated. From high school? From high school. I had a hard time getting in. I flunked the entrance exam to Berkeley. But they, the, the penalty would be either to take some coaching during the summer or take a, a course in your first semester called Bonehead English, at least by the people who had to take it. <laughs> but the reason I flunked it was not that I didn't know English, it's just that we had to write a book report. You know, they g gave us a list of a few books to read and you'd be surprised which one you had to write a book report on as part of the exam. Well, I, I just, I believe the person who graded my exam just had a different philosophy of life <laughs> than I did. It was a very well-known book and I no longer remember. Mm -hmm. 
but in 1944, uh, I had finished two years at Berkeley and enrolled in the Navy. Mm. And by doing that, I avoided being drafted into the, the Army. So where, I, where, what, where were you stationed and what happened? Well, for, fortunately, they had a wonderful new program called the Eddy Program. It trained people how to repair electronic equipment. So in, the, in those days, electronics was everything in new warfare. You had radio, of course, but you also had radar and you had sonar to look for submarines. And uh, they even had something called LORAN, Long Range Aid to Navigation, which is the early equivalent of, of uh, what we have now. With, with satellites. With satellites. We didn't have satellites then, so they had transmitters built at, at willing countries which sent out pulsed electronic signals which you could use to triangulate and f find your longitude and latitude. Mm -hmm. So most people had never heard of Loran, but I was trained to re repair and maintain all, all these electronic devices. It was a very valuable training. It lasted <coughs> essentially a year. Uh, I first had to go to boot camp in Great 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 Lakes Naval Training Station. That took a month or a month and a half. And then I, we had to go to the pre-electronic school to make sure you knew Ohm's Law. That was in Chicago and lasted a month. Then we were transferred to one of several intermediate electronic uh, schools run by the Navy. And I got to go to the one in Monterey, California. They they took over the Del Monte Hotel, which is a few miles from Monterey, and converted it into an electronics training school. And that lasted three months. But then came the, the, the big course, and they had, uh, that took six months. And there you really ha had to be trained and repaired. The nuts and bolts and everything. Mm. Yeah, climbing masts, and check on the circuits, running the antenna and so forth. Even if the ship is going like this. But I spent six months there. The base was actually in San Francisco Bay on Treasure Island. Treasure Island is an artificial island you know, originally before 1939, which is part of the bay. Mm. But they filled in, they put in landfill. And, and, and there, there's a big tall island in the middle of San Francisco Bay, it's called Yerba Buena. And the, the suspension part of the Golden Gate Bridge ends on Yerba Buena where there's a tunnel that takes you through to the other side, and then there's the cantilever part of the bridge. Oh, okay. And that, and that was built in the, I guess it was the 30s also. Mm. And why am I saying, oh, well, Treasure Island was, was a landfill island, artificial island, built to be the location of this, the World Fair at, in San Francisco, 1939. Okay. In those days, they used to have a World Fair in some city. Uh, the city differed from year to year. Mm -hmm. They were still having them some years later. There was one in New York. And before that, my, my family drove from San Francisco, no, from San Diego to uh, Chicago for the Chicago World's Fair. And we, we stopped off in Iowa to, to see my father's mother. Mm. It was the one time we, we ever saw her. 
but that was obviously when we still lived in San Diego. I don't remember the exact date of the Chicago mm -hmm. World's Fair, but it, it might have been in, in when, it, when would it have been before 1935? Mm, okay. One or two years before. Mm -hmm. The Chicago one? Yes. Yeah, I think it was 33. 33, yeah. That so they had something the on the news recently about it. Really? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> now <Yeah>. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and so in those days, if you drove from San Diego to, to Chicago, it was a real... It's a real jaunt. <laughs> it's a real jaunt. All things break oh. down. <clears throat> they didn't have good tires. You'd have flat tires often. It's a long trip. Yeah, I think we got a little leak in our gas tank and they had to <laughs> put in a new one. What somewhere. kind of a car did you have? Well, I don't remember. That was okay. my father's car. Okay. But uh, where are we now? Oh, I haven't. I, I stayed in the Navy <coughs> for two years. I was discharged in 1946. But what happened was after I finished the school on Treasure Island, which was the, the senior, uh, they transferred me to the Philippine Islands. The war was still going on. Uh, th this was in 19. This was the summer of 1945. That's right. And and to catch a ship to take me to the Philippine Islands, they transferred me to San Diego. There's a naval base at San Diego, and the, mm -hmm. the ships that were going to the F F Philippine Islands left from there. <clears throat> so I was stationed in S San Diego temporarily, and I went there prob probably around early August. But on August 14th, the Japanese surrendered. Yeah, right. That made my mother very happy because otherwise the war would still be going on. So I ended up being sent to Subic Bay on the main island, same island that Manila was on, but 100 miles or so, so up the coast. It had been a naval base. <clears throat> and there I put into practice all they had learned. We used to, the ships, naval ships would come in and they'd send us out on a launch to work on their radar gear. Mm. <clears throat> there was one ship that came in and the skipper had been skipper since the ship was commissioned. And the radar had never worked, never once. And so in two days I fixed it. The first time, there were 27 things wrong with it. Probably most of those 27 were caused by previous technicians who didn't know what they were doing, <laughs> oh, that's be my good. guess. But that was very good duty because <clears throat> the food we got was for, you know, 15 meals a week with Spam. But if you went out to the ship, you could have lunch there, and they had really good food. Food was better. <laughs> food was really much better. Sure. And. Uh, So eventually, uh, I got sent sent home, and transfers to a, a naval base. I think near Livermore. I don't know whether it was Livermore or not, but it was within a stone's throw of Livermore, and that's where they gave me civilian clothes, and I ended up going home. Oh. That was in 46, mm -hmm. summer of 46. Is that right? 
sounds right. It's Did you go get... back, finish school after that? Well, that's what I was, yeah. uh, yes. So in the fall of 46, I re-enrolled <coughs> at Berkeley. And in uh, two years, I got my bachelor's degree. And I stayed on at Berkeley for my graduate studies. My aspiration is, you know, it switched from civil engineering to being a physicist. And they had the most wonderful physics professors at Berkeley then that you could ever imagine. I had courses from many people you've read about in the newspapers for the last 50 years. Uh, I even had Oppenheimer for one of my courses. Hmm. Emilio Segre for another. Panofsky for another. All the very extremely famous people. And. Uh, I, I did very well in, in school. My aspiration was to become a theoretical nuclear physicist. That's what I wanted to become. <coughs> there were four theoreticians on the faculty when I entered graduate school in 48. And all Four of them were theoretical nuclear physics. That was a very booming subject at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, accepted as a graduate student by Professor Giancarlo Wick, an, an Italian who had made many important contributions to theoretical physics at the, at the time. And I, I began studying with him. Mm -hmm. it, it began by reading the right books, not doing any research yet. But then 1950 came along, and this was a, a great disaster for the university. The regents of the University of California decided to impose a more strict loyalty oath on all its employees and faculty. It's all known as the Year of the Oath. And you either had to sign the oath or be fired. Well, all four theoretical physicists signed the oath and then resigned their professorships <laughs> in protest. They were insulted by having to <laughs> sign a loyalty oath. And all, all of our all of the graduate students in theoretical physics were left as orphans. They had no one to work for. I mean, these four theorists were very good. They, they, the four institutions they got jobs at instantly was Columbia University, Carnegie Institute of Technology, the Bell Telephone Laboratories, and what was the last one? Oh, University of Illinois in Urbana. Hmm. So, of course, the physics department decided to look for theorists who would be willing to come <laughs> and sign the loyalty oath. And they had to work long and hard for that. But they finally found a person in December of 1950, who said he'd be willing to come. But he, he, was, he was currently employed at Bell Labs and b busy on certain projects, and he said he couldn't come until July 1st of 1951. Now, he agreed to take on five graduate students. Of which you were one of them. No, I was oh. not one of them. Oh. I mean, there were s seven or eight orphans, and I don't know uh, how he decided which ones to take, but I was not included. So I was very sad because there were no other theorists there to supervise my work. Now, 
decided to go up to my office and I, or somewhere in the physics building. I took the elevator, which I never did. I would always walk up elevators and stairs instead of take the elevator, but I was feeling so blue. I <laughs> took the elevator. Well, the elevator stopped at the next floor up and Professor Loeb stepped in. Now, I had taken several courses from him as an undergraduate, and I, I did very well in them. He was a, a specialist in electricity and magnetism, and uh, during the war he was some, in the Navy, a flag officer in the Navy. He was in charge of degaussing all the ships in the Pacific. Just, but anyway, he looked at me and said, you look sad. <laughs> What's wrong? Well, I told him what was wrong. And I got a note from him the next day saying, uh, go see Cattell. He's agreed to take you on. <laughs> now, Cattell was a solid state theorist, not a nuclear theorist. So that's how I became a theoretician who worried about solids, condensed matter. Mm. And uh, he was he was going back before Christmas to Bell Labs and wouldn't we be back until July 1st. So he called me in and t told me about electron spin resonance. And it, it had become a very popular subject in the preceding three or four years. And um, lithium is a is a simple metal, and one of the professors at Berkeley had looked for the electron spin, the conduction electron spin resonant lithium, and couldn't find it, which was a, a puzzle. Uh, either the experiment was wrong, or the relaxation time of the lithium spins were too short, so you couldn't see a sharp resonance line. Mm. So he assigned to me as a thesis project to find all the mechanisms by which lithium spins can relax. In other words, if you get them out of equilibrium, they come back to equilibrium in a, with a certain characteristic time, it's called the relaxation time. And uh, that was the first time I saw Cattell, my thesis advisor. The second time I saw him was when he came back on July 1st. And I told him, I, I, I told him that I thought I'd finished everything he wanted me to do. <laughs> well, what he did was what he never would have done later in his career. He said, oh, in that case you'll need a job. <laughs> and so I ended up getting a postdoc job at the University of Illinois in Urbana. I was hired as a theorist and uh, The, uh, Illinois had become a very one of the best departments in the country for solid state physics. It had been built up by Fred Seitz, and uh, I went there to do theoretical work. But the radiation damage project was what I was working on. They had Atomic Energy Commission funds to support this research. Radiation damage is important in the design of nuclear reactors because the, the flow of neutrons and protons right. damages the metallic things that hold the reactor together. Well, I, I couldn't uh, think of uh, any decent theoretical problem to work on in that area. I said, what, what the world needs are facts, not theoretical speculations. It was a rather new field. And, and so I spent my two years as a postdoc in Illinois doing experimental work 
which I devised by myself and carried out by myself, and uh, w which was rather good work, as a matter of fact. When when the metals are irradiated with neutrons and protons, atoms get knocked out of place. They have to go somewhere, so they go to interstitial sites in the crystal crystallographic lattice, leaving a vacancy behind. So in those two years, the first year I studied the motion of interstitials and vacancies as they diffuse around as a function of temperature. And the th th second year I spent measuring the, the heat that they liberate when they annihilate one another. An interstitial in the vacancy which is just made by knocking an atom out of place, leaving a vacancy behind, and mm -hmm. they try to f find one another once again and, and give up some heat. So I developed a, a calorimetric technique to measure the energy liberated when the interstitials and vacancies recombine. W one thing I I one is advised to do, which of course I didn't know, is if you do something new, you should give it a name. Well, I never gave a name to what I was doing. Uh, if I were to name it today, I'd, I'd call it differential s scanning calorimetry. It's it's used extensively by physical chemists it's studying chemical reactions. But the inventor of this differential scanning calorimetry, if you will try to Google it, turns out to be some paper that was published 11 years after mine. <laughs> you have to give things catchy names. <laughs> Let's see, where am I? Well, after two years as a postdoc, you have to get a permanent job. And I interviewed in a few places got a couple of offers. I took the one to Cornell University. They, um, yeah. Let me ask you, were you married at that time? Were you married? Well, I should, oh. I'll go back and oh. um, tell you what happened the day that I talked to Charlie Cattell for the first, second time. Uh -huh. he, he told me, I. He asked me what sort of job I wanted, and I said I didn't know. So he had me sit me down next to his secretary and went into his inner office. He came out five minutes later and said, Fred Seitz just hired you if you're willing to live in Illinois. I said, sure. <laughs> so that was the easiest way to get a postdoc job is to have it. Sure. Now, Fred Seitz is w one of the fathers of solid-state physics. In 1940, he wrote a book, a big fat book on the modern theory of solids. He built up the solid-state physics department at Illinois, and uh, when he left Illinois many years later, he became president of the National Academy of Sciences, served eight years in that position. And then he became president of Rockefeller University. Mm -hmm. A very, very distinguished scientist. One of, the, one of the best I've ever known. So th that's how I got uh, my first job as a postdoc. Okay. And that evening I was walking across campus with an acquaintance and I had a great idea. I said, would you like to live in Illinois? You know, in the culture of those days, that, that, that question was only a proposal of marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and the girl involved was Margaret. And 58 years later, she's still by my side, as you can see. <laughs> Good. So the wedding was in August, uh, you know, about four weeks after that, mm -hmm. August 25th. So that answers your question. Mm -hmm. We were 
Now, one thing that happened when I was at Illinois, uh, I was doing experimental work because I didn't think there was any really good, interesting problems in radiation damage, theoretically. And on the other hand, the University of Illinois had become a hotbed of magnetic resonance. There was Charlie, in physics, there was Charlie Selector, Dick Norberg, uh, Art Kibb, and Walter Knight, and in chemistry, Herb Gutowski. These are all very well named, well known names in the field. Mm -hmm. So they had a, a, an interesting seminar going every week on magnetic resonance. Since I'd never gone to a seminar in magnetic resonance before, you know, I, I did my thesis in essentially six months and uh, read a little bit about it, but I bootlegged going to this seminar. And Dick, Dick Norberg mentioned in one of the seminars he was in fact giving that, that there is information to be found in the free induction decay. That is when you knock a spin system out of equilibrium. It, 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 the free induction decay is when it tries to get back into equilibrium. Well, I went home and, and thought, uh, what's, you know, what's going on in a free induction decay? And it, it, it's, you've got a, a metal there, in this case, if it, was, if it were lithium that is trying to relax back to its equilibrium state. And uh, one of the mechanisms, I, I studied five different mechanisms that would cause such relaxation into equilibrium. And one of them was the least important of all, namely the interaction with nuclear spins. The nuclei I have are like little gyroscopes too, as well as electrons. So I wondered what would happen to the nuclear spins during, when the, the electron spins were out of equilibrium. Now, if you're, if you're clever, you can knock the electron spins out of equilibrium by a percent or so. And uh, I calculated what would happen, as I already intimated, what would happen to the nuclear spins. Well, instead of being knocked out of equilibrium by 1% because of their interaction with the electron spins, they were knocked out of equilibrium by a factor of 1,000. In other words, by exciting the electron spin resonance, you can enhance mm -hmm. the nuclear spin polarization by a factor of a thousand. I, I did the calculation several times to make sure that I, I, I did it right, and I did. I got the same answer every time. <laughs> and I, I then showed Charlie Slichter, one of my colleagues who was in magnetic resonance, what I had found out. It was a complete surprise. There's no way you could have predicted by intuition that if you just disrupt one part of the system by 1%, the other part of the system goes up by 10,000%, <laughs> which is an enormous effect. Mm -hmm. And so Selector followed the argument that night and decided that he believed it. So he took a new graduate student and they decided to uh, build apparatus which could actually do such an experiment where you, hmm. it's a double resonance experiment where you have one oscillator that works on the electron spins and another oscillator that works on the nuclear spins. Well, this involved technology that didn't exist yet, so it took them about a year and a half to 
to build the apparatus. <clears throat> it hadn't been f built by the time I left Illinois, where they were doing this. Hmm. And a few days after I got to Cornell University, Margaret and I were looking for a house to live in. I, I got a, uh, a telegram, the secretary st stuck a telegram, no, she stuck a note saying, you have a telegram. Well, that frightened me very much, because if you may remember in 1950, if you got a telegram, it was because somebody in your family mm -hmm. died. But I finally got courage to um, go pick up the telegram, and it was a telegram from Charlie Slichter. He said, the first time we tried the experiment, it worked, and it agreed exactly with what you had predicted. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Well, that was consoling for a special reason. I uh, talked about this phenomena, which I predicted theoretically, at the Washington meeting of the American Physical Society in 1953. I was still in Illinois at the time. And um, I, I had a 10-minute talk that was scheduled in a nuclear, in a magnetic resonance session. And sitting in the front row at that session were the four biggest names in magnetic resonance. All four of them have Nobel Prizes. There was, there was Felix Bloch from Stanford. There, there was a uh, Norman Ramsey from Harvard. There was Ed Purcell from Harvard, and uh, who, who was the fourth one? Purcell, Block, Ramsey, and Robbie, Robbie from Columbia University. And after my 10-minute talk, <coughs> the chairman of the session, who was surrounded by the other three, was Ed Purcell, and he got up and said, we think you've, you're violating the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, I just decided I didn't want to argue with those guys, so I just said, I, th I don't think I have. And let it go with that. But here were the four stars in magnetic resonance, you know, dis disbelieving it. I also sent a preprint of the paper I was about to write to Charlie Cattell. And what I'm saying now I know because the story is told to me by a friend of mine who at the time was a roommate with George Fair. George Fair was a new graduate student at Berkeley at the time. He was starting to work for Cattell. And Cattell gave him the preprint of my paper on this dynamic nuclear polarization and said, uh, study this paper and give a seminar on it in a few weeks, but be sure to find the mistake. <laughs> well, he didn't find any mistake. But th that phenomenon is what is in the field is known as the Overhauser effect. And it has been applied in a number of ways now, and it is an effect which allows people to determine the structure of proteins and mm -hmm. other biological molecules. There are several books written on that. But uh, you mentioned in your, that you wanted me to discuss. Just make a comment if you'd like. Yeah. I mean, you talked about it already, I think, covered how, it, how it came about. Yes. The, uh, that was an exciting thing to have happen. Uh, At 1953 is also the same year for the double helix, right? Watson and Crick, the DNA. It was so around there, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yeah. But the, the deepest work I've ever done, you know, some things take a long time. Some things happen very quickly. The, 
discovery of dynamic nuclear polarization took me two days. Wow. If, if not just one afternoon, I, I, I didn't show it to Slichter until I had done, done it uh, several times. But uh, I want to tell you about the, the work in neutron interferometry. Uh, this happened, well, it began in 1965. I was still at the Ford Motor Scientific Laboratory where I left Cornell to go there. Um, they were building a new scientific laboratory and the, the person who was going to be manager of it was a very persuasive person. And all my friends told me, don't pay any attention to him, those are all lies. But it turned out that all the lies turned out to be true. <laughs> And it was the best research environment I've ever seen on the surface of this earth. For, for I stayed there 15 years. I, I left Cornell after five. And uh, it was an ideal move for me to make. But one of my colleagues at the Ford Laboratories was Sam Werner. He had recently got his PhD in neutron diffraction. They had a research, a little research reactor at Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. And uh, in the middle of 1965, a, a paper appeared in Applied Physics Letters, which I, I didn't see, I didn't read that journal. But Sam Werner saw it and called me into his office. He said, Bonds and Hart have built an X-ray interferometer uh, and they describe how it functions in this little paper. Then he said, what do you think we could do if we used it for neutrons, if we had a neutron interferometer? So we, we agreed to get together again two hours later. And he had dreamed up an experiment. Instead of using x-rays sending through the neutron, in, through the interferometer to send neutrons through, he said, you know, one of the very myster mysterious things about elementary particles, if they have half integral spin, is that if you rotate the particle spin direction by 360 degrees, uh, we're talking about the world of wave mechanics. Things happen because they're are being described by wave motion. <coughs> and that's quantum mechanics is essentially wave mechanics. But if you rotate the spin of a particle by 360 degrees, you don't get back the same wave function you started with. It's, it has changed sign by a factor. It's a changed sign. There's a minus one that comes in. Very, very mysterious. This was discovered by Dirac, one of the real giants of 20th century physics. And uh, so in an interferometer you have a, a beam coming in and you break it into two beams and then bring them back together again. And where the two beams that have been broken apart then can interfere and if you if you if if they had the same distance from there to there, the interference would be you double the size of the wave function. They were 180. One is shifted by 180 degrees, then the two out here cancel out. And so he he had thought up this. 2 pi precession experiment, as it's called, as a possible application of a neutron interferometer. And I, I'd come up with a, a different idea. You have the, the neutron beam come in, breaking up into two, coming back together, interfering. But suppose you rotate it about the beam by 90 degrees. So instead of going this way, they, they, they went this way. <coughs> 
Well, if one goes up and the other goes down, <coughs> that there could be an effect of gravity on on the interference. And I predicted that, that if you had a neutron interferometer working like that, if you rotated the whole thing about the incident beam, the the intensity of the beam coming out the other end would go up and down enough times to make it a feasible experiment. So, you see that the the idea of that experiment took exactly two hours. Now, the people who wrote the paper, Bonds and Hart, said that this interferometer wouldn't work unless the interferometer crystal it has to be made out of a perfect crystal of, and they had used silicon. It had to be absorbing. Now x-rays are strongly absorbed so and they claim that's why their experiment worked. That they could make x-rays interfere with one another. But, but silicon d doesn't uh, absorb neutrons. And so according to Bonds and Hart, the, a neutron interferometer made out of silicon wouldn't work. Now silicon is used for these things because one could then buy large single crystals of silicon where every plane of atoms is exactly in the right place and that's necessary for the uh, an interferometer to work. So we, uh, there's another semiconductor called indium antimonide, and indium absorbs neutrons very strongly. So we bought the finest indium antimonide single crystal that was available on the surface of the earth, but didn't work, it wasn't perfect enough. In other words, you couldn't grow any mantemonized single crystal the way you can grow silicon. So we uh, we let that that idea lay dormant. And uh, that was in 1965. But then I I came to Purdue in 1973, and in the spring of 1974, Roberto Colella <coughs> was entertaining at his home in a party for this seminar speaker. And uh, I think the seminar speaker was in the field of <coughs> X-ray diffraction. And I told him about the the two neat experiments that could be done if only we had a single crystal of indium antimonide to make a neutron interferometer out of. And Roberto was uh, overheard that remark and he said, what's wrong with silicon? I said, well, it doesn't absorb neutrons. He says, it doesn't have to. But that's what Pons and Hart said it had to. He says, they were wrong. And, and Roberto is, was one of the world's experts on the <coughs> dynamical theory of diffraction. And he convinced me that the experiment could be done with silicon. So the next week we went to the head of the physics department, who was Earl Fowler at the time, and told him about this experiment. And he authorized to spend up to $10,000, something like that to build such an interferometer out of silicon. Silicon is a very hard material. The only thing that can cut silicon is diamond. You have to use diamond saws <coughs> made out of little silicon chips to cut silicon. And so Roberto built an interferometer out of silicon and it, surprisingly it, it worked the first time. He, he with x-rays, you could see that it was acting according to the principles of wave mechanics for x-rays. And so all we had to do was find a way of, of 
mounting the interferometer so one could r rotate it s s smoothly. And uh, if you rotated the silicon crystal by just a few degrees, the interference went away. And uh, we assumed that the well, I assumed that the in interference went away was because the large single crystal of silicon. I, I brought a picture. Here, here, here's the in interferometer that we first made, and there are, the, the beam comes in. The first the first ear splits it into two beams. The second ear directs the tube over to the third one, and the over the third place over here. Brian, should he hold that up a little bit? Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that interferometer was put into a, a box with apparatus for rotating and neutron counters and things like that. <coughs> But we couldn't rotate the interferometer without losing the coherence. Uh, we this was built this this was built out of a, a cylinder of perfect silicon, which the semiconductor industry could could provide in those days. It, and it was we. We just uh, we had a piece of metal with a V groove in it, <laughs> and just uh, set the interferometer down in the groove, being held there by its own weight, mm -hmm. and that that didn't work. So I I tried the following thing: I went downstairs at home to our pool table and cut some of the green felt from the skirt of the pool table and made two, two green strips and put the two green strips between the interferometer and the metal and, uh, and then studied how fast we'd lose interference as a function of how far apart the felt strips were. You know, the felt strips were too far apart, it could sag just a little bit in the middle. If they're too close together, it could sag at the ends. And so we were able to find the separation between the two felt strips so that we could rotate the interferometer 20 to 30 degrees. And so we, so Sam Werner got back into the this experiment by designing the neutron. He, Roberto and I were not familiar with neutrons. So Sam put together all, all this stuff here up at Ann Arbor. And so we t took the interferometer up to Ann Arbor and d did the experiment. And it worked the first time. We got, you know, eight or 10 oscillations in the rotation from minus 20 to plus 20 degrees. Now this is a this is a very deep experiment because gravity, as you may know, controls how stars move and planets move and asteroids move. Mm -hmm. Gravity is an extremely weak force. You know, you divide electric forces by one followed by the forty zeros, and that's how strong gravity is. Whereas uh, quantum mechanics w works on things that are of atomic dimensions. And uh, this is the first experiment in the history of physics where the outcome depends on both Planck's constant and the gravitational constant. It's, a, it's the only. Now, what we prove <coughs> is that you have to put the gravitational potential into the Schrodinger equation, which is what. quantum mechanics is all about. And th that was back in 
75 when we so 35 years have gone by and there's still no other experiment in, in, in physics which involves simultaneously gravity and quantum mechanics. In other words, we proved that the gravitational potential has to be put into the Schrodinger wave equation and uh, no one has ever done that. Well, we also later did this other experiment about rotating the spin of the neutron through 360 degrees. And it, in the relative phase, acquired a factor of minus one. <coughs> An interesting story I like to tell in that connection is I was giving a colloquium at MIT on, on the interferometer experiments. And at the end of the colloquium, Victor Weisskopf, I don't know whether you've ever heard of him. He was a professor at MIT. He was director of a big laboratory over in uh, CERN in, in, in France, I guess it is, mm -hmm. for many years. He was there. He After my colloquium, he got up and came to the podium looked out into the big auditorium filled with graduate students and faculty. He said, I have a confession to make. He said, I, I never believed in that factor of minus one until today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very nice.